now. Uh, it's gratitude Sunday, so I'm going to try and wrap this thing up quicker. Uh, I want to finish what we began looking at last Sunday. Last Sunday, we looked at the title, Running and Finishing the Race. And today, I want to conclude that second part. I want to conclude that second part as we quickly read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And verse 7, it says, I have fought the good fight. This was Paul talking to his son in the faith, Timothy. As he was getting ready to exit, he he said, I fought a good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept this faith. These three things are important in our own journey through life. Make sure that whatever fight you're fighting is a good fight. You're not just going around fighting random fights. Uh, fight that don't concern you. You're fighting everything and, y- you know, uh, and you're getting into trouble than you ever been. But it's time to choose your fight wisely and just be strategic. And just sometimes you just want to pray for people. Sometimes you just want to uh, just counsel them. Whether or not they yield your counsel, uh, it's none of your business. Yours is just to give them the counsel and, uh, and then don't hate them. If they decide to do something else, uh, choose the fight. Of course, we know the walk of faith is a fight of faith. And it's a good fight because Jesus has won the ultimate battle for us. And he says, I finished the race. Whatever race you start in your life, it is a gift. And uh, in fact, it's a spiritual discipline to um, become a finisher. It's easy to start anything. Anybody can get excited about starting anything. You can wake up in the morning and just get excited and get married. Uh, you know, these days people can get married just like that. And, and, and just, but it takes maturity to stay in the marriage and ensure that you see this marriage to the end. When I say to the end, I don't mean to you divorce. Because you're, you're thinking, oh, Pastor said to see you today, so I'm going to wait and we get the bus. No, uh, marriage in God's agenda is meant to be for uh, for life. Amen. Uh, if you will read the Bible carefully, we will see that um, to an extent you're not permitted to remarry if you divorce. There is an aspect of that, but of course uh, we're not saying stay in a marriage where your life is about to end before the marriage ends. You know, uh, <laughs> and no, no, no. That's not what we're saying. But we have to have the right perspective about having uh, the the starting of that marriage. We are also in it to the best of the other person and ensuring that uh, we are finishers in the sense of we are in it, whether things are good, bad, or ugly, we are in it for the long haul. All right. So it's, it's it's a Christian virtue to become a finisher. Anybody can wake up in the morning and start a business. Or because Brother Summer has a business, I also want to start a business. But if you don't understand what goes on after you've started the business, uh, uh, your integrity, and doing what you promised the clients, your customers, that you would do. So it takes a level of uh, commitment to be a finisher. Uh, Anybody can wake up and start a church. But it takes the grace of God to be consistent. I mean, if you've pastored for a while, they will tell you that there are days that you have to believe God and there are days that things are nice. There are days that people you've labored for uh, will be there for you. There are days they won't be there for you. And there are days that members in the congregation are going through stuff and you you can't carry everybody's problem on your head because you're going to be worn out for the people that actually need help. Uh, So everybody, so a pastor's life is this, you go visit some people, they've just lost a family member, so you have to be depressed with them, and then you go and visit somebody else after that, that has just had a baby, and then you have to rejoice with them, and somebody has just lost a job, you have to feel sorry for them, and somebody else is getting a new job. So all of these things are happening at the same time, and you can start something, but it takes the grace of God to finish whatever you started. Uh, but it, Paul says, I have finished the race that I started. 
And he said, in the midst of finishing all of this, I have also kept the faith. Don't lose your faith, whatever you're going through. You can go through so much stuff in life that if you don't keep your faith, the enemy is after stealing your faith. You're still going through it, but you're murmuring, you're complaining, and your attitude has shifted towards God, and you're somewhere, somehow mad at God, but you can't really show it to people because you still want them to think you're still a Christian, you're still following Christ. And uh, what do you do when you're Jesus' disciples and all of you are going to be martyred? All of them, it was only John the Beloved that didn't get killed, but all of them, they were followers of Jesus, but yet some, some even said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my master, so kill me upside down and all of that. And all of them went through horrible and challenging experience, but in the midst of everything, they kept the faith. Please tell somebody, keep your faith. Keep your faith. No matter how challenging life becomes, we must keep the faith to the end. And then we saw Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, that says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. That word ensnares means to be trapped. The sins that get us trapped. I don't know what you're trapped in. I don't know the, the uh, spiritual repetitive cycle that you're trapped into. The Bible says we can lay aside everything that has trapped us. In other words, you are not at the mercy of whatever it is that you feel trapped into. In God, in Christ, we have freedom. And it is unto freedom that Christ has set us free. Don't let nobody lie to you. You have dealt with that addiction for so long that you don't even recognize yourself when you look at yourself in the mirror. No, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, You've got the grace of God to lay aside every weight and every sin which so easily beset that ensnares us. If you would change certain things and if you will make certain hard decisions, you can lay aside whatever has ensnared you, whatever has trapped you. You've got the grace of God to lay it aside and you are not a victim in Christ. You are more than a conqueror. And it says, and let us run, because you can't run with all of these things, all of these baggages, all of this stuff that are all over you. You need to run with endurance. You need to run with confidence. You need to run with perseverance. He says, let us run with endurance. Notice, we are running with endurance. The race that is set before us. So those two scriptures, we see the race in those two scriptures we've just read, that it is not just a race, it is the race. So Paul didn't just finish a random race, he finished the race. We also saw last Sunday that the writer of the book of Hebrews encouraged us to run with endurance. The race that is set before us. So it's not just enough to run the race, as you're running the race, there is a place that endurance serves in running that race that you're supposed to run. Just because it's the race you're running doesn't mean you won't be invited to quit and to give up. Just because God told you to do what you're doing right now doesn't mean the enemy is not going to come and discourage you and throw all kind of things at you. In fact, the moment that God asks you to do it, there is an enemy that is already spying your ability to get that job done. That's what happened in the garden. Adam to keep the garden and look after the garden, there was a Satan that showed up that was jealous of the place that man take in God. In essence, God replaced Satan with man and he gave us that glory and he, he gave us such a, 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 a dominion over everything that Satan wasn't happy and that's what he was after when he was tempting Jesus. If you look at the temptation of Adam and the temptation of Jesus, there is a parallel. There is similarities there. 
He used food in the Garden of Eden. He wanted to use food again. He used um, the, the desire for power, the desire, loss of the eye, loss of the flesh, and the pride of life. Those three things, if you can master those three things, you are well on your way to being able to conquer every temptation Satan throws at you. The moment God tells you to do something, there is an enemy that don't want you to do what God asks you to do. There is an enemy that don't want you to obey God. The moment you choose to walk in holiness and purity and to get rid of certain things in your life, uh, that's when you'll be tempted in those areas of your life. So as you, uh, just because you're running the race doesn't mean everything is going to be unkidori. In fact, that's when we need to run with endurance. There are days that we feel like quitting and, and, and throwing the towels in, but that's when we ought to hold on to what God has promised us. Uh, I remember after the pandemic, uh, uh, the church was wherever two or three are gathered, uh, and, and uh, some of you can remember those days, uh, whatever church you're part of at that point, uh, and one had to pray, God, uh, what are you saying and doing in this season? But we have to dig our heels in and continue. I mean, I look at some of the messages even on YouTube and the passion with which we were teaching and preaching the word didn't even drop a, a dime just because we believe God said to carry on doing what we were doing. Regardless of the pandemic flowing all around, we were enduring through the season of that pandemic. And here we are at the other side of pandemic and shame on the devil, glory to God, that in spite of all the fear and all of the uh, paranoia that he was throwing around, here we are still sitting together, and we don't have to greet each other with elbow, glory to God. We can actually hug and shake one another. So just because God said to do something don't, doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I want you to please get rid of that in your psychic. Quitting is not an option. No, 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 no. You have come too far to quit right now. Just like the children of Israel, there is something we call between and betwixt. What do you do when you have left Egypt? You can go back to Egypt, but you are not yet in your promised land. And now you are stuck in the wilderness. So instead of complaining, you must well start thanking God that faithful is he who has promised because a journey of 40 days can actually become 40 years by you just complaining. Please tell somebody, stop complaining. If you keep complaining, that thing gets more complicated. But if you start thanking God, I'm telling you, he will start to make a way where there seems to be no way. And before you know, you're like, how did I get here? I got here by Thanksgiving. So just, be just because we're running the race doesn't mean we don't need endurance. We need endurance. Some other Bible word is patience. There is a time of conceiving the promise of God, and there is a time of giving birth to the promise of God. The things that you have conceived, I'm telling you, if you will stay and stick to it, God, who has given you the power to conceive it, he will give you the power to push those promises out. So as we run the race, there is need for endurance. The right of the Hebrews uh, encouraged us. And then I introduced some questions last week. I said we, we were considering those questions. Whose race am I running? Am I running a race that I designed and chose for myself? Or am I running a race that other people expected me to run? Or that others have manipulated us to run? Or am I running a race that the society... And the system as designed for us. They, they want us to buy newer plate number all the time. I wonder why do they have to do all these cars with plate number all the time. Uh, there are countries where they don't use the year of the car as the plate number. Uh, you have to look at the shape of the car to find out the car that the person is driving. But in the country we live here, just when you show up like this, they know the year of your car. Uh, and, and you get, okay, I'm going to buy a brand new car. And then by the following year, your car is now old. <laughs> I, I, said, I said to my wife, I keep joking, I'm going to just put a, a, a private plate number on my car, and then nobody knows the year of my car. 
End of story. <laughs> Maybe that's why some people just get private number, not because they want you to know their name or something. They just get a private number. But if you're not careful, you're running the race that a society wants you to run, and you're ever chasing the shadows they want you to be chasing, and you never find peace just chasing stuff that are not part of God's agenda for our lives? Or are you running someone else's race? Or am I running the race that I was meant and designed to run? Uh, every time a marathon runner uh, tries to run a sprint, he will get frustrated. Uh, you can't tell Mo Farah, and I, I know those guys, they get really fast. Uh, maybe by the last lap of the marathon, they just start to sprint. But he, 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 he can't be as fast as Houston Bolt in that, uh, in, in that 100 meter dash or whatever it is because he's not built for that kind of race. Uh, and you can't, in, for the life of Usain Bolt, you couldn't get him to do 800 uh, uh, meters or to run with Mofara. The guy would just be, he will, uh, let's say like we normally say it, he will carry last. Because they, you have to be built for the race that you are attempting to run. The question we're asking ourselves is, am I actually built for the race I'm running? Or have I try, am I trying to run someone else's race? Uh, some of you are professionals here. I, I, I envy you. I celebrate you. But that is not what I'm called to do. I try to be a professional in terms of a uh, secular job to try and get a law degree. And God still allowed me to at least finish the degree before he asked me to, to start coming to pastoring. I mean, what we do is different to what a lot of you do. But the, the point I'm making is, to then try to do what you guys do and say, I'm going to be Dr. Julius for a week. I will be so frustrated. I'll probably give people all the wrong injections in the world and diagnose them and, and, and tell somebody it's crazy when they're absolutely fine. And he can't try to do my job for a week. He probably run out of leads. <laughs> Why? Because we are all, there is, the, the point I'm trying to make is this, you are designed and wired by God for certain specific tasks, and your job is to ensure that you align yourself running the race that it built you for. And how do I discover this race that it built me for? It's very simple. You just keep following Christ, and before you know it, you are running the race that you're supposed to run. Is it as simple as that? Yes, it is as simple as that. If you make Jesus, because he then tells us in verse 2, uh, uh, in that verse, the next uh, verse 2 of that Hebrews 12, verse 2, he, he tells us that looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, despising the shame, and he sat down, sat down at the right hand of God, at the right hand of the throne. And, and if you follow Jesus, if you keep your eyes on Jesus, you will eventually find yourself in the race that he wants you to run. When Paul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, he said, what do you want me to do? And he said, hey, I've got this assignment for you. And look at the life of Paul. Uh, and now we are referencing Paul. We are quoting Paul. Why? Because he was a follower of Jesus. If you are a true follower of Jesus... Uh, uh, there is a way he will navigate you into the lane that he has for you. But the problem is we all have all this idea in our head. We have all of these things that we desire to do. Uh, and when those things are not working, we are frustrated. But the, the thing is, as you keep looking on Jesus, the author and the finisher, he got you started in this journey of faith. Keep your eyes on him. Keep following him. He is your shepherd according to the book of uh, Psalm chapter 23 verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. If you follow the shepherd, you cannot miss your way. Glory to God. If you allow him to be your shepherd, he will ensure that it's not just your needs that will be met. Your wants will be met as well because you're following the shepherd. So we are seeing this thing now where we don't want to run other people's race. 
I don't want to run the race that anybody has designed for me. I don't want to run the race that my parents designed for me. I want to run the race that the, the one who fashioned me in my mother's womb designed for me so that one day when I stand before him, I want to hear him say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Ooh, it's sobering. I just pray we all hear that when we stand before the one who made us and fashioned us in our mother's womb. So we're considering that phrase, the race. So when we're looking at this phrase, we said two things comes to mind. The Christian race, the corporate race that we all run together as believers. And I spent a bit of time extensively last Sunday to expand shade on that race that we are running corporately. And I gave the analogy of a, a marathon, how if we all run in a marathon, not marathon, excuse me, relay race, how we pass on the button to other people. And if you don't run your leg of the race well, you are, uh, the team is going to lose. The need for all of us as believers to help each other in this journey. In fact, the Bible tells us when somebody falls into sin, those of us that are stronger, we have to restore those that are falling into sin, ensuring that we ourselves don't fall into sin in the process of thinking we are restoring someone else. Where should people go when they miss it? It ought to be church. But we've got this idea that it's only perfect people that are in church. No, it ought to be a place where we come to and we are at the feet of Jesus asking for mercy and asking him for restoration. Hey, Paul, hey, Peter, whenever you miss it, don't run away from Jesus. You have to run to Christ. And that has helped me in my journey. Even as I've walked with the Lord for 26 odd years, there are times I messed it up. There are times I got it wrong. There are times I said things. There are times I did things. But at all of these things, I ensure they are not taking me away from Christ because if the enemy can sever you from him, he will deal with you. He will show you pepper. But if you stick with the Lord, where can we go from you? For you have the words of eternal life. If you tell him, Lord, you are my last bus stop until this add addiction breaks in your presence, until this mindset breaks in your presence, I ain't going nowhere. And if you stay with him, he has a, word, he has a way of molding and shaping us to what he wants us to be. So I've got news for you. Church is not for perfect people. Please tell somebody church is not for perfect people. So let's all stop pretending. Let, let's stop pretending. Uh, making the sinner feel like he's worse than all of us. If all our lives should be played on this screen right now, we probably won't talk to each other afterwards. Huh? But, but thank God, God in his mercy, he has a way of reserving everything to the day of judgment and he will play before you and you watch your own drama and you can hear what you need to hear before him. But thank God that we can all help each other corporately as we run this race together. But the second aspect of the race is your own individual race within the corporate race. And I said, your ability to run corporately is dependent on how you're running individually. If you're not running well, you're going to be a bad runner in this relay. In other words, if you've had a bad week, you've been sinning all week, permit me to use that word. If you've been watching stuff all week, and you've been going through all kind of things all week, you haven't read your Bible, you haven't prayed, you haven't walked in the love of God, and, and the tendency is when you come to church, you'll probably be like, why am I not feeling the presence of God here? Yeah, you can't feel the presence of God because you're another, you're another zone. But when we all come together, that's when you're able to see God will show you what somebody else is probably dealing with. And there is a word in your mouth for them in the, in the course of drinking tea and coffee together. The pastor is not the one that meets everybody's need. God is the one that meets everybody's need. And he uses you to meet each other's need. So when we get together like this, the Bible says every joint supplies. And all of a sudden, the Lord is prompting you and putting somebody in your heart to buy them lunch. And instead of you responding to that voice, you start binding the devil and saying, is this devil telling me to buy somebody lunch? <laughs> Why? Because you've not been in the spirit. Somebody's looking sad. You can't even see them. Uh, but God in his goodness, wants all of us 
to run our individual race well so that corporately the church is, is stronger together because we are all the church together. We are all the called out ones and not one person can meet everybody's need. God is the only person that meets everybody and everybody's needs simultaneously, but he has a way of meeting people's needs through one another. So the way we are running our corporate race, uh, have you ever wondered why certain churches are filled with people that just hate each other? It, it's not because everybody just hates each other. It's because a lot of people are hiding hatred in their heart. So when hatred, when hatred connects with hatred, what you have is a bigger hatred. And the thing just becomes a wildfire. But if you have a church where people have a heart to love God and to serve God and to be obedient and be a true servant of Christ like chosen church, and we say amen, amen. glory to God, what you have is an atmosphere of love. It doesn't mean we're perfect, but it just means because we've all chosen and made a decision to love God with our heart and to walk in the love of God towards one another, all of a sudden it becomes a sweet atmosphere to be in. Glory to God. It becomes an atmosphere where you're looking forward to going to because everybody is bringing their own supply of love, their own supply of selflessness, their own supply of compassion, their own supply of, of, of living life outside yourself it doesn't just revolve around me who can I be a blessing to so when they go shopping they buy extra tin of milk they buy extra noodles they buy extra uh, uh, coffee I don't know if you drink coffee or not praise the Lord uh, they buy extra this extra that before we know it our food bank table is massive at the end of the service and everybody can go there and pick what they need for the week glory to God and nobody's hungry in our midst so this corporate race is largely dependent on how each one of us is running this race. Three ingredients that I want to quickly leave us with that will help us to run our own individual races very well. Number one, endurance. These three ingredients will facilitate how we are running our own race. Number two, we have also focus, endurance, focus, and healthy boundaries in your life. So what is endurance, in case you're asking, what is this patience and endurance that we're seeing in Hebrews? Uh, endurance simply means the ability to endure an unpleasant or difficult process or situation without giving way. It, it means the ability to endure something unpleasant. Just because you're a believer doesn't mean everything is going to be fine in your life. But there is a grace of God to stand. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 tells us that uh, stand your ground. Having done all to still stand, it doesn't mean we don't go through what unbelievers are going through. But there is something that holds us together that don't allow us to fall apart in the middle of facing what everybody in the society is facing. Does it not feel like depressing sometimes? It does feel like getting depressed, but there is a Holy Spirit that has been given to us to help us to stay joyful in the middle of depressing situation. Does it mean we don't lose loved ones? We lose loved ones, but there is something that tells us, hey, we're going to see them in glory. Glory to God. And we don't, we don't, uh, we don't mourn like those without hope. It doesn't mean we don't go through what the world is going through, but there is a blessed assurance. My, my. There is a blessed assurance in the middle of all the vicissitudes of life. Doesn't mean we don't lose jobs. Sometimes we lose jobs, but there is a God who supplies all our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So this endurance now is the ability we have to endure an unpleasant and difficult process or situation without giving way. We saw how the writer of the book of Hebrews introduces us to the concept of endurance as each one runs our own race. In that verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 12 again, he says, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, 
Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Verse 2 then tells us to look unto Jesus. Please tell somebody to keep looking at Jesus. Keep looking at Jesus. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him, look what he did, he also endured. And when you start looking at someone that has endured a situation, it's easier for you to also endure. Did you know what you're going through right now? God has a way of bringing glory out of that. If they can stand in the middle of all of this they are going through, I'm telling you, I can also stand. And that's why the enemy wants you to quit and to give up. And you don't really know who is looking up to you until you mess things up. But when you make a decision, you know what? I'm not quitting, not even just for me. Uh, the children are looking at how we are responding as parents to one another in the middle of argument when things are not right in our homes. How is it that we are treating our spouse? All of this has effect and impact on our children. In fact, some of you are sat here today. There are certain things in your life that you just wish you were not exposed to when you were growing up. People that grew up in abusive situations, oftentimes thinks it's the normal way to live. Maybe you grew up in a family where people shout on each other. You just start thinking that's the way to shout. So you come to the UK, you start shouting on people. And then they wonder what's going on here. What, what did we say? And you get married, you start, start to shout on your spouse. And they're like, calm down, what did I do? Did I say something wrong? And, and all of those negative impacts can live through your adulthood life if you don't renew your mind. But there is a grace of God to renew our mind and to decide, you know what, I'm going to do things God's way. And when we make those decisions, there is a grace of God that comes along that decision we have made. So what is it that facilitates our endurance? If endurance, endurance is important to run in our race, what is it that, uh, that makes our endurance to last Till when, in, when it's supposed to last still, number one, you must keep looking unto Jesus. We're asking the question, how did Jesus endure what he went through and he didn't give up? If you look at what people are doing, you might not even see the need to endure. Looking at Jesus means, what would Jesus do in this circumstance right now? Why should we look at Jesus as we try and bring this thing to a close? Because Jesus is our perfect example. You often see Paul saying something like, follow me as I follow Christ. Because in the reality, in the grand scheme of things, no human being is actually worth you looking up to. And those of you that have been disappointed, disappointed by people, you can testify. People that you respected, pastors you respected, leaders you respected, only for them to make certain decisions and you are almost close to losing your faith. Hey, I want to encourage us today, let us keep our eyes on Jesus because Jesus is the only person that never failed, that God uh, through whatever he went through. In fact, the Bible tells us in Hebrews that he was without sin. He was tempted like we're tempted yet without sin. That's why we should be looking unto Jesus. Why? He's our perfect example. If you will keep looking on Jesus, your endurance will be ever strong. Why must we look on Jesus? It's because he went through everything we are going through right now, and he was able to still finish. Matthew chapter 12, verse 2, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Just like I took on my cross when I was going to, the, uh, to Golgotha, the same way that I took on my cross, you also take your cross, but don't stop at that. You must keep following me because there is a grace that comes to follow us of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. There is a grace that is released on those who choose to follow the Messiah. It is sad to see many Christians giving up because of, the, of, of all the Christians that gave up. They left the church because someone else left the church or because their friend left the church. They left their own marriage because someone else left their own marriage. 
Do you have the boldness to do the right thing regardless of someone that's doing the wrong thing? Sila. Do you have the boldness to do the right thing even if someone so close to you is doing the wrong thing? Do you have the grace of God on your life to say, you know what, they were not there when it formed me in my mother's womb so their decision cannot control my destiny? So Jesus says to follow him and carry our own cross. Just as our finger, uh, fingerprints are different and unique, so are God's plans and purpose for your own life is unique. Jeremiah 1.5, he said before he formed Jeremiah in his mother's womb, God knew him and God set him apart for a purpose and as a prophet to the nations. Look at Galatians chapter 1 verse 15. Galatians 1 15 to 17. But when it pleased God who separated me. This was Paul from my mother's womb. There is something about being in your mother's womb. God was doing a great work there. Nobody was present. You and God was just there. So why should you arrive in this side of eternity and start to allow your life to be dictated by other people's decision? Come on, keep your eyes on Jesus. I don't care who drops out in this race. I'm going to keep running because at the end of the day, when you stand before God, they're not going to be there. Think about it. But there is a, some kind of witchcraft in this generation that people just want you to follow them, what they do, especially when they're doing the wrong thing. But it's time for us to make a decision. You know what? I'm going to do the right thing. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't care who thinks the word of God or the Bible is not the word of God. I don't care how many people bow to Nebuchadnezzar. If there is only one Daniel that is still standing, come on. Can we be that Daniel in this generation we're living in? That we make a resolute that, hey, we're going to endure to the end. They may be telling us that the Bible was put together by some people, but we Hey, I've tasted this thing, man. I've been in the middle of the night where this thing has come through for me. It's too late for me to now shift ground. No, I've, I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. He has kept me when I felt like losing my mind, when everything was breaking out all around me, when I was sick, when I was close to losing my life. God somehow turned everything around. It's too late to come and tell me God ain't real. Come and tell somebody God is real. God is real. Glory to God. Let me jump. Why should we follow Jesus? Because he's our shepherd. Psalm 23 verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Don't make following anyone else a priority over following Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 to 5. Verse 3. Verse 3 says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. Second way to maintain your endurance Number one, we said by looking at Jesus. Number two, maintaining your joy. Maintain your joy. Bible joy is not based on what's happening around you. It's based on the truth and revelation you have. Isaiah 12 verse 3. Isaiah 12 verse 3. It says, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. The, uh, the salvation is deep, but joy enables us to draw everything that is contained in salvation. I'm going to leave us with this. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 to 23. But the fruit of the spirit is love. Joy. Underline that. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 as we close. It says looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of, your, of our faith. So how do I maintain my endurance we say by looking at Jesus and maintaining your joy here is what Jesus that what allowed Jesus to be able to endure the Bible says he for the joy for the joy that was said before him did you know you can actually escape whatever life is throwing at you right now by this spirit of joy that you are not bogged down by all the circumstances of life. I believe someone was sharing testimony and they said that sometimes we can be so engulfed in the things we are believing God for that we don't even see the things God has done. 
that if you take a moment like we do at the last Sunday of every month and just recount of the goodness of God and just look over the trajectory of our life and just be honest and sincere with yourself. Times you could have lost your job. Times you could have lost your loved ones. Times that things could have gone anywhere in your life. Times that you felt you would lose the house and you don't know where the rent is coming from. Times you felt lonely and all of a sudden the arm of the Father was all around you. Times that you felt you were at the end of the road. Times that you felt that you were on your last meal only for a prophet to show up to say, cook me some meal. And for three years, you didn't lack what to eat. Ask the woman that Elijah said to in the midst of famine. When you thought you were on your last lap, of strength, of encouragement, and God just sending people your way to pray for you. All of a sudden, somebody calls you out of the blue and, and begin to speak prophetically into your life. All of a sudden, you thought that was the end of the road when everything was so bad in your life. All of a sudden, God making way where there seems to be no way. Come on. There is a grace of God to still see light at the end of the tunnel. And as we round up this finishing our race series, it's time for us to keep our eyes on Jesus. If we're going to finish the year strong, you're going to have to keep your eyes on Jesus. If you're going to finish your race in this life strong, you're going to keep your eyes on Jesus. And in the process of doing that, we have to do what Jesus did, which was for the joy that was set before him. I know some of you are about to transition through countries and move countries. And right now, it's not pleasant. Some of you are changing jobs. Some of you are not. Things are changing in your field, in your professional career. But like Jesus, if you keep your eyes on the joy that is set before you, if you don't allow the sadness, temporary sadness, to deny you of the future joy, I'm telling you there is a way you keep running that race, even though things are really bad, but when you are on the other side, you will look back and you'll be like, how did I get through that horrible situation? It's because, because of the joy that was set before you, you didn't allow what was happening temporarily to deny you of the, of the, uh, the joy, the, the fruit of the Spirit, which is joy. I want to encourage us as we keep running, don't let nothing steal your joy. Did you know happiness and joy are not the same? Happiness is based on all the happenstances around you, but joy is based on the revelation you have, which is, I know my Redeemer lives. Go and ask Brother Job, how did he get through six months of boil and crazy friends and everything around his life? It's because he knew there is a God in heaven. And if I can hold on to him, I'm coming out on the other side. Please tell somebody for the last time, you will finish strong. Can we please rise up as we pray and close and just receive that grace again? Lord, every spirit of distraction, the, the other thing I wanted to talk about was focus, but I believe I've touched on that. As we focus on Jesus, as we keep our eyes on Jesus, did you know when you lack focus, you are not able to run really well? If you're looking everywhere, you lose momentum, you are prone to accident if you're driving and you're looking everywhere. You probably run into accident. But if you're driving and you're focused, come on, there is a call of God on your life. There is something precious about your life. Come on, you haven't come this far just for God to forsake you. If you will stick with the one who got you started in this race, if you let him hold your hand, all through the vicissitudes of life, all through the ups and downs of life. I'm telling you, the end is sure. You will be like Paul at the end of your journey. You'll be like, I've kept the faith. I've run my race. And now I'm ready to receive the crown that is set before me. Lord, I'm declaring that over this congregation that we are not a people that, are, that is into giving up. We are not a people that knows how to quit. We thank you, Jesus, because you finished the race on our behalf. We also walking in your footsteps. We will finish the race. I don't know what it is that you're facing right now that is so challenging and you feel like quitting and giving up. Maybe you feel like giving up on your career. Maybe things are very challenging right now and all hell you feel like is breaking loose against you. On this Gratitude Sunday, we release the spirit of joy on you. 
I come against spirit of depression in this atmosphere. We take authority over it. Maybe financially things are very wrong right now. And I even come against the spirit of suicide in this atmosphere. I, re I, I arrest that spirit that has been trying to talk you into ending things and taking your own life. We take authority over that spirit right now. We decree and declare with long life, he will satisfy you. We declare over you, you will run the race that is set before you. You are not losing momentum. You are not losing ground. Ground, you are gaining ground in the name of Jesus. I decree there is encouragement in this atmosphere. There is such a spirit of joy in this atmosphere. We decree and declare regardless of what is happening around us, we will maintain our joy. And Father, we say thank you for teaching us how to run well, for teaching us how to see the race to the end. Oh, I pray over marriages in this church that you will, you will stand the test of time. Regardless of all the assaults of the enemy on families, on homes, on marriages, your marriage is protected in the name of Jesus. I decree and declare over you, chosen church, that that which God help you to start, you will finish strong in the name of Jesus Christ. And together we will lift up our hands in victory. Together we will see ourselves at the finish line and pat each other on the back and say we made it. Glory to God, we made it to the 31st of December. Regardless of all the assaults of hell on families in this generation, our family will make it. Our children will make it. Our loved ones will make it. In the name of Jesus. And I release that anointing to finish upon you right now. You are not a quitter, you're a finisher. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and let all the finisher in the house say a big amen.